Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with Paul because coming back to Troquera this time for me was very poignant because the last time I was here two years ago, uh, Marie Colvin was here and she was getting very agitated about what was going on in Libya and was anxious to be off and I've just learned from Paul that M Marie left here in the middle of a party and got to Edinburgh Airport and hitched a ride on a cargo plane to London so that she could uh, uh, get out to Libya and uh, Marie was killed in Homs in Syria. Uh, last year, and uh, I'd known her for 20 years, and she was, I, in my view, the best eyewitness reporter of our time, and certainly the bravest, and she was also a wonderfully generous and funny and intelligent woman, and she's very much missed, and Paul was with her when she was killed. So I want to kick off this discussion about how difficult it is for reporters and photographers and uh, cameramen and so on to get out there and get the news back compared to... Uh, the industry in which I started 25 years ago. Um, so, Paul, talk to me about that, that last trip with Marie. You, already, you knew each other well by now. You'd worked together a lot in Libya and Syria. Uh, why did you go back when you already had the story? Um, it, was, it was down to the fact that um, we'd, we'd been in Babaramra, in Homs, and we'd, we'd worked for four days then. The, 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 the conditions were atrocious. The shelling was a constant bombardment, and essentially there were no military targets. So what they were doing really was was killing off the people of Homs, which was seen as the heart of the revolution. Now we we got out because they said there's a land invasion coming. The forces are coming in tonight, um, and and if you're here, it's over. So they got us through um, a tunnel. We got in through um, a, a kind of four foot storm drain that you had to walk through for three kilometres. So we were in. Um, it was the, Marie said we'd both spent time in Misrata, which under siege for two months <laughs> we thought we'd seen <clears throat> the worst that people in could do in Libya. Um, but on entering Homs and Babaramra, we, you know, it was immediately apparent that neither of us have seen anything like this before. But the fact was, it was against the civilian population. So when we were evacuated, we got out um, and we woke up the next morning, and Marie woke woke me up saying. Paul, Paul, they didn't invade. You know, we screwed up. And so it was like, okay. Um, so we tried for a few days to get up to Hammer, which was also under siege. Um, no luck, they couldn't even communicate with the town 30 kilometers down the road. It was, it was communications was that bad. So we decided, well, look, you know, and Marie particularly got, when she got into a story, it, it became her story. And she was aware that there were 28,000 civilians in there and nobody was in there covering the situation. So it was just a five-minute discussion. Shall we go back in? Of course we shall. Um, so we went back through the tunnel into Baba Amra. Um, we didn't tell the editors, actually. We just um, unilaterally went in. So the first they knew is when we got a, an email from Marie saying, we're back in Baba Amra and it's as bad as ever and you know, you could kinda of hear the editors fainting at the other end. Um, so yeah, we returned because um the story was still going on and um there was no way we were gonna we were gonna pull out and leave that situation develop. Um that amount of civilians in that area under the under the attack they were they were facing. And uh in her in her last twenty four hours alive she made some T V broadcast, didn't she? Yeah, well, we'd, we'd, we'd been in for two days, and to be honest, we had a small discussion where it was essentially we both agreed we, we weren't getting out because the, uh, daily the bombardments were growing. The house we were in had been hit. The top floor had been taken out. And we, we just couldn't leave the building. It was So it you was thought you were going to die? Yeah, we, we said, look, you know, we're not going to make this Sunday's paper. You know, so shall we essentially go on air, go live, and, and do the best we can to tell the story um, via Skype to CNN, Channel, Channel 4, and BBC. We, we talked to the other activists in the, in the media centre, and, and they said, look, you know, that's what you do, that's what you're meant to do. We didn't want to put them in danger by going on. And they said, no, you're here to do it. Get your story out. Tell me what that feels like, to, to, to think that as a result of a decision you've made, you're going to die young. Um, it was a, I mean, it was a slow acceptance, really. As as the days passed, it was. We just couldn't see a way out, and and the. 
the whole point of us being there was to get this story out. So, and, and we also knew there was a big risk. You know, there was a big risk in just staying and waiting um, to die. But also, you know, if we're here and we've got this information, we, 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 should, you know, we should get it out by any means possible. And were you frightened? Was it scary? Yeah, it was terrifying. I think anybody goes in places like that and says they're not scared is either, you know, mentally ill or, or just plain stupid. Because it's yeah. that, you know, you need that to keep you on your toes. I mean, I've been a couple of times in a sim not, not, not anything like as terrifying as that, but where I thought, oh, crikey, I've just made a terrible decision. I'm going to... I'm going to die now. This is and my, I have a, my own experiences. You have a mixture of feelings, including self-recrimination. You feel yeah. angry with yourself, and you feel really foolish. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a part of that. And I mean, as we were going in, just before we got in the tunnel to go in, I did yeah. say to Marie, I said, "Look, I, I had this feeling building for a couple of hours," and I said, "Look, I said I've got a kind of bad feeling about this." And normally in Libya, and that, if either one of us said, "Not sure," we 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 kind of pull out or not not go down that road or not go into that bit of desert um, and on this one she just didn't get that feeling I got it and I, I explained you know I, it's a gut feeling it's based on nothing um, but I had to say it and I'm glad I did um, but she said well look you know this is the story and it was a two minute discussion and then we carried on and yeah there was a point when I was in there where we both looked at each other and went mm -hmm. we've kind of pushed overstepped the mark on this one, but we were there, and it was it wasn't you know you couldn't book a taxi out. It was it was quite a process. The the other sort of guilty secret we all have is that <clears throat> despite all this, actually the job is great fun. Absolutely, and there is a kind of dark humour in those situations that doesn't really travel. <laughs> it just sounds when you when you repeat the sort of jokes that are made in normal civilized society, it, it sounds a bit. Perverse. Yeah, people look sick. at you like a bit yeah. strangely yeah. and back off a bit. Yeah, but Marie didn't lose her sense of humour, did she? No, you? I mean, to, to, we we woke up. We'd um, we'd planned to go to the field hospital. No, we'd agreed with the editors. Finally, caught us on Skype, and that, I'm sitting there, and the Skype thing started ringing. It was Sean for an editor, and I was like, Marie, Sean's on the phone, and she goes, "Tell him I'm not in." <laughs> I'm, I'm like, what? what? Should I say you've gone shopping? Or what? <laughs> and I, I just pressed the button and Sean's gone, what are you doing? And I was like, where's Marie? And I said, um, and she stood there going, I'm not in. I'm not in. It's like, I said, oh. And he goes, Paul, she's there, isn't she? And she's going, no. Oh. So he got us on the lap, you know, on the, on the sky. And basically he said, look, you know, get out tomorrow. He said, get out when you can. We said, we can't get out tonight. It's impossible. And so we had this conversation and we, did, we agreed to leave. But about midnight, we sat there, both a bit like, yeah, well, it's easy enough saying get out. And then as we sat there, um, Edith, William, and Javier, three other French reporters, Spanish and two French, came in. And Marie just looked at me across the room and gave me a little smile. She said, come here. And I walked across and she said, you still want to go with the Euro trasher here? <laughs> and, and it was like, OK, point taken. Um, so we, we thought, right, we'll get to the field hospital in the morning which was about a kilometre away, but it was a, a, all the cars had been blown up, so we had to run there, and every junction was covered by snipers. So we woke up, of, we said to this guy, Abu Hanin, you know, we want to go to the field hospital at five before the snipers wake up. And he goes, OK, I'll, I'll be there. Don't worry, I don't sleep. And so I wake up, and there's Marie walking around in circles in the room in the pitch black, effing and blinding. Going, he's fucking dead and he's asleep and he said he doesn't sleep so he must be dead and I was like alright calm down Marie so we went to sleep for another hour or two thinking we'll wake him up then so we're tiptoeing down the corridor trying to not wake anybody up and Marie goes shit the snipers are going to be awake now and there was this little pause and she went and the French <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was it, you know, I mean, at that point, we, we, <coughs> still, we still thought we were going to meet the field hospital and, um, and, and, and get, get another story and then start making our... Well, not making our way out because the French were there now, yeah. so that had kind of precluded any exit strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we got into the room and it, it was just a room full of bodies, you know, just sleeping under six blankets. And she wore this um, big, long Chechen-style robe with a hood, so she looked like a mad monk. You know, and walking around this room, 
Um, and then we had the two shells. I had two rockets impact about 100 metres either side, and then another two about 50 metres either side. And I was an ex-artilleryman, so I kind of recognised the bracket, and they were, they were closing in. Mm. And almost as I had the thought, they're bracketing. Um, the room we just left just was was hit by a rocket and was just disappeared. Um, and I was, my cameras were in there, so I actually went back in and saw my bag in the rubble, grabbed it, and and as I ran through the corridor, another missile came straight through the wall just behind me. And it was by then it was just absolute chaos, the smoke, the dust, the chemicals from the from the rocket, and then another hit above us, and the ceiling started to fall in. At which point I thought it was over, they'd done the job. So I'm, I'm looking for my camera to get a few shots of what was going on. And someone screaming, get out, get out. And just mate, as you can imagine, chaos. Um, and at that point, I'm just about to take the shot and then another missile hit on the front step. It landed on the front step. Marie was about a metre from then. I mean, tragically, you know, it was instant, fast and instant. Um, and you were injured quite badly. Yeah, well, I'd been... Um, I was standing there, and I, I thought a bit of brick had hit me or something, a bit of foot masonry. And I kind of... Well, oh, it's a bit uncomfortable. And I put my hand down to my trousers, give it a little check out, and my arm just popped out the other side of my leg. And I was, like, stood there like a cartoon character with black smoke coming off me, black face, with my hand through my leg going, ooh. And for ten seconds, I stood there going, oh, no. Hospital food. No, I was li literally going like, I was going, uh, rubbery potatoes, congealed custard. And I'm going, but don't worry, people can bring stuff in. And all this is going on, I'm stood there going. And so I put me on, while I was in there, I grabbed the artery in the bow and I had enough sense about me to check that I wasn't going to bleed out. So I put a scarf on from around my neck and put a tourniquet. And then I thought, oh, I'll walk out. And I got about two steps and I realised I couldn't actually walk. Um, and I fell over, and, and unfortunately I fell right next to Marie and Remy, who had taken the full force. And that's how you knew? And that's how I found it. But then I couldn't move then, because this, the drone above spotted me moving in the rubble. So they opened fire again and started shelling the street. So I was kind of laying there, and I saw an Ethernet cable, and I was like, oh, great, grabbed it, put another tourniquet on it, and honestly, the best use I've ever found for it, an Ethernet cable. I think that's what they're designed for. But I had to lay there for about 50 minutes, and they, they were just shelling because they wanted everyone everyone gone. Um, I couldn't move, and uh, I'm just laying there thinking, I really, really want a cigarette right now. But it was I was in the rubble, and the, the, the shrapnel from the, the shells exploding was just about that far from my head, so I thought, that might be a bit dangerous. So I waited. And then, actually, I thought, well, that doesn't actually hurt, because I couldn't feel a thing. There was no pain. And they dragged me back in the building after the shelling, and then it started to hurt. Mm. And you know, I was like, ouch, mm. you know, this, this is pretty bad. Mm. Um, but they took me, after a, a while, they dragged me to a, into a car, threw me in a car, and took me to the field clinic. And I knew the doctors there, so it was a bit weird being wheeled in. And this doctor's going, Paul? And I'm like, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and you became the story. Yeah. Which sorry. you regret, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do regret it, but it also gave me a platform to um, to talk about what happened in Baba Amra and, uh, and not shut up about it, which is, you know, yeah. which was what I thought was the best thing because Marie would have... I just thought, would she want me to lay in an empty room in a hotel, in a hospital, and, and not, not, not speak about what happened? So it was great because... I could talk for two minutes about what happened to us and then actually, you know, um, voice what had happened in Baba Amra. So in a way, we did get the story out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's been a bit of a battle not to, to keep it away from us and what happened. Because yeah. we saw a fraction of what them people lived under for, for months. Yeah. Um, you know, it was horrifying to think that where we were, there were 28,000 men, women and children living in rubble. Um, so, yeah, it's been a battle to not be the story, which is always, it's not what you want. Yeah. You know, you go there to get that story, but obviously, yeah, when something happens like that, it's... <clears throat> we are talking about you today, though. We are talking about you as the story, because we want to discuss this, this pro the problem of how difficult the world has become to report. James, you, uh, you've recently been in Somalia. 
and Yemen, which are two of the most difficult and dangerous countries <coughs> on the planet. Do you, have, do you ask yourself whether it's worth it? <clears throat> yeah, uh, all the time. Um, and Afghanistan too, and there are places that you go where um, every minute of every day is a sort of a, um, a kind of ongoing calculation of the risks and the risks and rewards. Is it really worth going to this place to get this piece of information or, or not? And um, it's kind of, I guess, what keeps you alive. You have to keep sort of making that calculation. And if you let it slip, then you, um, yeah, you can get yourself in, in great trouble. Um, and the way I deal with it is to spend as little time as possible in these places. So you work out exactly what you need to find out before you go there. Um, and when you get there, you work as hard as you possibly can and then you get out because it's a simple, the longer you're in a dangerous place, um, the more likely it is that something's going to, going to happen. So you do everything you can to mitigate against the risk. Um, and in Somalia and Yemen, the problem really is, well, Somalia, there are several problems. <laughs> um, but the one that's common is kidnap. Um, and it's, it's completely out of control in Yemen. Um, and you can't really, I mean, you can vary your routine, you just keep a low profile, you obviously don't go to places where it's known that kidnappers are hanging out, and there are places like that, but you can't really um, mitigate completely against that because it's so random, and they're always going to be ahead of you and they can watch you and so on and so on. So, um, but it seems to me that kind of spending as little time as possible in these places is probably, probably the way forward. Um, and you just don't take unnecessary risks. And I was, <clears throat> thinking about this on the way here, I mean, a long time ago in Afghanistan, I was just saying this to you before before I came on stage, about um, I mean, it was 15 years ago now, but I was going to go up to the front line in Afghanistan. This is, the Taliban was still taking over the country then. There was a sort of live front line which you could go and visit. And a party of Western journalists kind of came back down the mountain, completely adrenalized from this experience. They'd just been up there before me, and they kind of, oh, God, you've got to go up there. It's fantastic. There's a, there this great show. They, they, they put on a firefight for us. And I went, hang on a second. Um, and it turned out that this sector of the front line had been completely quiet for two months. Um, and the sector commander had seen three Western journalists come up and, and said, oh, we'd better do something for them. And so they started firing shell fire at the other side, who then started firing back. And there were people being blown up down the line in the trench. And these guys had come back down, they kind of got all their photographs. But I mean, they weren't even very kind of mainstream journalists. They were working for, I don't know, Battlefield Weekly. They were kind of kids, freelancing, really. And at that point, I thought, I'm not going to go. There's just no point. I mean, not the risk to me, but the risk to other people becomes yeah. something I don't want in my conscience, thanks very much. And you don't actually always need to go to the front line to <clears throat> experience being shot at to report on the shooting. I yeah. mean, it's different if you're stuck in homes, but I mean, that's quite often the case. You can, because they don't, the readers don't care if, whether you were there or not. They, they're going to read about it, they're going to read about it. If you're, you know, your date line says, I don't know, Mazari Sharif or, or whatever it is, um, that's probably enough, quite often. And uh, so that's one way that you, you know, you just have to be sensible. They're, yeah. When I was working in Africa, I used to see, to divide my friends into two camps, really, the adrenaline junkies and the ones who just just stepped back a bit, were there, were present, but gathered their material by carefully and um, scrupulously interviewing people who'd been there themselves, and sort of were, so to, 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 instead of just enjoying the high of, right. you know, the adrenaline high, which I've never, I've never enjoyed the adrenaline high myself. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> the ones I admired most were those who stepped back <clears throat> and went and found people and got them into a quiet place and listened carefully to their accounts and piece together, and Marie was one of those. Absolutely, uh, she she did. You know, she, she she she. One of her great strengths as a journalist was the ability to listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the journalists who have, who have an ability to listen are the ones that I've yeah. always admired. Um, that's, that's very. <clears throat> I mean, like, like my last book about Afghanistan was based on interviews with soldiers who just come back. In fact, I did most of my interviewing in Cyprus, um, and there was a reader on Amazon. I never paid too much attention to my readers on Amazon because the reviews are mad, but they um, quite often, but I got one star on the grounds that I hadn't been in the trench with the soldiers. So that's a complete waste of time. This, but it, it wasn't true. If you interview a soldier in a trench, just you're not going to get very much because they're kind of, you know, like that. But I found that a month afterwards, when they would had a bit of time to reflect on it, you've got a much better story and you get all the kind of nitty gritty because it's fresh. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and that seems to me a much better way of kind of gathering yeah. the story than <clears throat> actually sitting in the back of a truck and taking yeah. shell fire quite yeah. it can be. You know? The look at me, look at me in the thick of it kind of school of reporting is deeply suspect for me. Mm. Um, you've recently um, 
combined your journalism with something completely different. Tell us about your obsession. <coughs> oh, my new project. Your new obsession with yeah. water. Um, yeah, I'm just finishing a, a one-year master's uh, degree. It's called a master's of research at Strathclyde University in uh, hydrogeology, um, which is a bit of a departure for me because I'm actually a... I have got a degree, but it's in English literature, so I know absolutely nothing at all about maths. Or I, I do now. I've, I've found out all about aquifer mechanics and God knows what. And um, and this is a <coughs> a sort of a, a bleak way into the, my next story, I hope, which is about Yemen, um, which is running out of water. Um, and Sana, the capital of Yemen, is uh, predicted by the UN and various people to it may run dry completely in ten years, becoming the first world city to do so, and, and, and then what? And it's, a, it's actually a, a, a continuation of the, the same story I've been covering for 10 years, which is about Al-Qaeda, who are very big in, in Yemen. And one of the reasons they're getting so much support is that they are providing water for villages that have been failed by the government. I mean, they are providing basic services um, in terms of groundwater and water harvesting and all the rest of it, the infrastructure. So it seems to me to be, I don't know if it's going to work yet, but it, I, I was in Yemen in June and it, it did get me into the country. You can't, it's very difficult to go there as a journalist. You just turn up at the embassy saying, hi, give me a press visa, they'll tell you to, to mm. get lost. And so I, I went actually as a, as a hydrogeologist, as a cover story. Um, but I am, I mean, I, I mean, not just a cover story, I'm actually doing it for real. And uh, so I spent a lovely month talking to Yemeni hydrogeologists. It's like a salmon fishing in the Yemen, but for real, you know, <laughs> that's what I've been doing. And, uh, and it is indeed fascinating, I mean, just the, the water situations. And entire society um, don't have any water in their taps, and they get all their water from tankers to deliver it. Um, it's all drilled water that comes from their aquifer, which they've completely over-exploited. Um, so the water table is dropping in Sana by, in some places, 10 metres a year. And it's going to run out, and it's just going down like a bath. And uh, I, that seems to me to be really fascinating. What happens next is that there, you know, there is already tremendous amounts of violence in Yemen over water rights and grazing rights, which is only going to get worse. And Sana may, it's a city of two million people, it, it, it may fail. How do, you, how, do you, how do you move a city of two million people, which, by the way, is the oldest inhabited city on Earth? I mean, it's, it's founded by Noah's son, I mean, according to legend, and, um, and a beautiful place. And so... I, I think that, you know, and it has application all over the world. There's many places in Africa where it's going to have the same problem. Maybe in America, maybe Las Vegas, maybe Atlanta, Georgia. You know, so. We're talking about dangerous places. <coughs> you've got a nice life in Edinburgh. You've got four children. You've got a nice life in Devon. You've got children, haven't you, Paul? Three, yeah. Yeah. Why do you go to dangerous places, and what do your wives and children say to you about it? Ooh. <laughs> say many things. <laughs> um, why do we go... Firstly, I, th I think at the heart of, of it is um, we're all storytellers in, in one way or another, whether it's pictures, films, um, re reporting, um, and our line of storytelling, our interest is, is well, certainly with Marie and I, we, we, we got on famously. No one, Sunday Times couldn't believe that she'd kept a photographer for more than three days she normally abandoned them at the first opportunity. Um, but we just hit it, you know, I mean, I think the way we met helped. Did you, did you know about it? How did you meet? <laughs> we were in the desert in Syria, waiting the, the last Gulf War. Just, there were about 30 journalists all stuck in this, it's a hotel called a Petroleum Hotel. Beautiful place in the middle of the desert. And every day we had to go to the Mahakbarat office, the secret police, to try and get a piece of paper that would allow us to cross semi-legally into Iraq. And after 30 days of visiting this officer, everyone would get up and they would turn into zombies and just walk down and this guy would wait for half an hour and he'd go, no permission today. And everyone would up sticks and walk back to the Petroleum Hotel, which was a pit. And so after about, I think a month and a half of sitting there, we'd all sat there one day and everyone was you know, dribbling and... Mm. <laughs> And it was like all going into coma. And this door burst open, and Marie stood there. It's the first time I'd met her. And she just came in. She didn't even enter the room. She just stood at the doorway and went, My God, they're drugging the fucking journalists. <laughs> and, and left. And that was, she didn't even come in. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Wow, that was a good, that was a good entrance. Yeah. And so I got bored. 
really bored. So I, I roped a couple of other guys into building a boat we, out of lorry inner tubes, which we smuggled up to the border, paid off a couple of guards and that. And um, had the boat all set up with all the kit on it. And just as we're about to, to board it, we made life jackets out of Coca-Cola bottles and everything. It was all really well done. And then the kind of Syrian army founders so started shooting at us, and fa- fortunately they were crap shots. So we ran off down the river and uh, looking to steal a boat to go across. But eventually they caught us and uh, they kept us for a couple of days. And then eventually we met this mad general who just thought it was really funny. Because we were going, no, we were looking for refugees. He goes, Paul, we found your boat. And I was like, ah, the boat. (laughs) So he just let us go. He just thought, you know, just get out of Syria, go. So back at the hotel, no one else had talked to me then. All the other, all the other journalists were like, you know, you're going to spoil it for everyone. <laughs> so I'm sitting on my own in the corner. And Marie bursts in the door and she goes, who and where is the boatman? <laughs> and I was like, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> and she just come across and goes, I like your style, boatman. And that's what she called me forever, you know, boatman. So a bottle of scotch later and, and that's how we formed. But, you know, it was... It was storytelling. It was like, you know, we, we both tell stories. And, but they were the story. You know, the, the further in you get, the deeper you get, you actually start getting to what's happening to the people on the ground. Yeah. Um, and not the geopolitical situation or yeah. the political situation. It was what was happening to the people at the, ro- you know, the, the wrong end of the stick, so to speak. Yeah. And as for family, they're just... Um, <sighs> yeah. yeah, deep say he's off again. But when I got out of Syria... And I was in hospital and I hadn't seen the kids and that. The three kids come up, me 12-year-old walked in, looked at me, gave me a hug and said, Dad, you're a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, that's my boy. <laughs> James, what about your family? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, my appetite for risk seems to go down with every... I've got four children now, and every time I have another one, my, my kind of appetite for risk yeah. goes down a bit a bit more. I, mean, I, I don't take the risks I did when I was 25. Um, why do I do it? I mean, I, I find these places very interesting, I suppose, and the, the greatest satisfaction I get out of it, actually, is a sort of just probably completely vainly, but I kind of like to think that, actually, if you write a decent book about what's going on in Afghanistan, you might have a a chance of making a difference in terms of policy. I mean, I really do kind of think that it's... I mean, my big shtick in Afghanistan is, I mean, is talking to the Taliban. I've been going on about it for years, and yeah. now finally it is policy. But yeah. I, mean, I was saying, you know, this isn't going to work, guys. You know, since 2004, I've been saying, you know, this yeah. is, you know, you've got to talk to them, this is how you do it. And, and I went to meet the Taliban to prove that you could do it, you know, twice, three times. I mean, you can do it. So, and I'm still banging on like that. And there is a satisfaction in maybe just contributing to... Um, to people doing things differently, and that's the power of information. Um, as for what my wife thinks about it, well, um, the children like the fact that I met pirates in Somalia. That goes down quite well. <laughs> uh, and they tell their mates, they go, oh, "My dad's met a real pirate." You know. <laughs> um, I mean, there was a time in in Afghanistan. I had a, I mean, this thing of kidnap again. I was, you know, and I was about to go and meet the Taliban, and there's bit of concern at home about that and I had a sort of um, an arrangement with Melissa my wife about what I would do and I was going to call if I possibly could and then I told her you need to kind of contact so and so you know anyway of course I managed to call her by mistake in my pocket for my mobile phone and um, and luckily I caught her I heard this little voice and it's the middle of the night because of the time difference and um, I was fine I just happened to press it I was in a hotel you know. um, but I just heard this little voice going hello hello are you there like, <laughs> And uh, I luckily heard it because she was about to call the embassy, I think. It would have been rather awful. But um, I don't know. I think she's... I I hope she's... I mean, I I do try and persuade her that I I minimise the risk as much as possible. I'm not about to build a boat and float into Syria, you know. That was in the early days. Yeah. (laughs) No, I did something similar in Afghanistan once before the... the, When the Taliban was still in charge, I took a... A, a raft made of uh, oil drums and, and wicker <laughs> across piled with television equipment and, and uh, you know to get into the northern northern territory across from right. from, from, from Tajikistan it was a surreal experience but uh, before I throw it up into the floor I just want to tell you one story because I've met Marie in 1991 when the first at the time of the first Gulf War and to begin with I was stuck in Jordan and Marie was in Baghdad 
and the war was coming. It hadn't started yet, but we knew it was coming. And Marie's husband, Pat Bishop, was in Saudi Arabia with the British troops, so they couldn't talk to each other. So Patrick would phone one of us in Jordan and with a message for Marie, because we could ring Iraq, because the landlines were still open, and Patrick's message to, to Marie was, get out of there. That's right. Tell Marie she's got to get out of there. When, th when this happens, it's going to be really heavy. I can see what's coming. So I'd ring Marie and say, Marie, Patrick says you must leave. <laughs> and she would say, ah, tell him there's a Russian peace plan. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> and um, when I was leaving Baghdad, this is what you, one of your stories reminded me of this. Since we're in Scotland, I'll tell the story. When I was leaving Baghdad, there was a mistake on my exit visa. So I'd driven down what was called Scud Alley. It took about 10 hours from Baghdad to the Jordanian border. And I got to the Iraqi frontier post, and there was an error on my uh, exit visa. The, the spelling of my name didn't tally uh, with, anyway. And he wanted to send me, the, the, the border guard wanted to send me back to Baghdad, which was a disaster because I didn't have enough petrol. I was going to run out of petrol in the desert. And I was arguing with him and arguing with him. He said, no, he was absolutely insistent. And I was completely alone with a Jordanian driver. And then finally, his, this, his commander arrived. And he said, the commander said to me, looked at my passport and said, what is your nationality? And I thought, well, so I'll just try this. I said, I'm Scottish. And he said, ah, you Scottish, you are like we Arabs. <laughs> and I said, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> he said, your country too, the Englishman took over. He stole your oil. <laughs> you are like we Arabs. Brilliant. Stamp, off you go. <laughs> so it was a huge advantage as always to be, Scot <laughs> to be Scottish. I want to, um, I want to throw it open to the audience now because I've hogged it for long enough. We've got a roving mic. Does anybody have a question? You must have. <laughs> yes, at the back. Uh, a lot of what was talked about yesterday about the Arab Spring cropped up again and again, and what everyone was saying was crucial in that was uh, social media and sort of citizen journalism. I, I wonder if you three feel sort of threatened by that or feel like professional journalists are being displaced at the heart of these events. Um, actually, no. I've, I've been asked that before. Um, I think the two actually go quite hand in hand, given the, the limited resources that you know the, the news, the major news agencies have. The fact that you know you can you can sit on Twitter or Facebook and you can get a far greater overview of yeah. what's happening, um, and I think the editors find it quite nice to have this vast amount of information because they've got to decide where we're deployed, how long we're going to be there for. So it's um, it it makes life easier in many ways um, to actually pick the right places because you can only be in one place at once um, and certainly with Homs and getting into Syria and Baba Amra you know we, we were getting information out and of course every time it showed on the news it's, there's a little sign there saying can't be verified um, but you kind of see it enough times and you can go well okay something's happening there yeah, yeah. and and that that narrows down um, you know it, it's quite nice and narrowing down where we have to focus on so we can then go to the place and you know, uh, and 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 see if this is true, and and work out. Whereas before the social media, Twitter, Facebook, you could often be shooting in the dark. You know, you could be in the wrong side of a country quite easily, and hear that it's all happening over there. So I I don't see, um, I don't feel that threatened by it. You know, no. Maybe I'm wrong, and we'll all be. James. No, I don't either. I think it's. I find it an incredibly useful sort of source of information. I use Twitter all the time. I mean, it's great. Um, and online, I mean, everything about it. And as for citizen journalists, well, I mean, of course, they're going to be in places, at the right place at the right time that you're not going to be, but they can only get sort of information out. They're not writing books. I write books. I mean, they don't, on the whole, write books, citizen journalists. Perhaps they do, some of them, but it's a sort of different thing. I don't feel threatened by it at all, actually. I mean, it's, um, I'm very excited by it. I think it's a powerful democratizing force, putting real power and real influence in the hands of people who have never had it. And not just in war zones, in, in here as well. There was a great story I did a year ago about uh, how Twitter had, had empowered the people campaigning for justice in Liverpool. Uh, the, God, what's the name of the, the, the football ground where all those people were crushed? 
Oh, in Hillsborough. In Hillsborough, the Hillsborough campaign for justice there. What happened was they'd been banging away for years and years trying to get Cabinet Office documents released and the Cabinet Office were, compl were refusing to do it. And somebody quite famous, I've forgotten who now, um, tweeted about it and an online p petition started and they got 100,000 uh, signatures in five days, which triggered real action and they got the documents released. It's fantastic. And, we should, we, and I think by and large traditional media are embracing it and working out how to sit alongside it because there remains, despite, despite this, there remains a public appetite for a mediated, considered bulletin of the day's news on television, radio and in the newspapers. So traditional media will adapt and survive, I think, um, alongside this wonderful new uh, way, of, way of communicating. So uh, for, for the most part, I don't think traditional journalists do feel threatened by it. They want to, they want to embrace it. Or book writers. I mean, I or don't. book writers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Hello, Paul. Um, I'm so uh, pleased to see you here and, uh, and to hear your account of uh, Homs because two years ago this weekend I met this crazy woman, uh, this one-eyed woman who was a force <laughs> of nature and she was very informal and talked with all of us here and uh, she made a permanent mark on me and I had the privilege on the Sunday morning because this place doesn't have wireless and I, I uh, came from my house having seen on Sky News that uh, Tripoli had fallen. I brought this news to Marie and I instantly saw what you must have seen all the time. I've got to get a plane, I've got to go, I've got to be there, what am I, you know, and uh, she, I just cherished that encounter. We, we had a coffee together, whatever. But, but clearly heartbroken the following February to hear the experience you both went through. And there's a kind of closure for me today just to hear you recounting all of that. So it's not really a question, it's just a thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, let me ask you, a qu I mean, I, I did, reported from Libya when, I mean, you, you, this dark humour thing, when I went into Libya at a time when Gaddafi was still in power, the Americans were undecided about a no-fly zone. It didn't look as though anything was going to happen, so I thought I was going to have a quiet time. And the day after I got there, the Americans changed their minds about a no-fly zone. The next day, the no-fly zone was imposed, and we were stuck. We couldn't get out. There were no planes anymore. So I was saying things like, well, this no-fly zone, does it include business plans? <laughs> you know? But you knew that you had taken a decision that was... And, and you know, I'm the age I am now, and I've done, I did 20 years of it, and I thought, I, it was a moment of revelation for me, because I thought, I don't think I want this anymore. Right. I don't think I want to do this anymore. But I, I had to. I was there. And I did it with as much, with all the vigor that I, I that could. could but when I got out, I thought, I think that might be it for me. I mean, will there, will, will there come a time when you feel the same? Um, I assume that it, it hasn't, strangely enough, after, after mm. what happened in Syria, it actually hasn't, um, it's more down to my body than my mind at the moment, until I get all this up to strength mm. and that. But I don't think, um, I don't think that did it for me. I, I, when I got out and I had to get better, you know, it was about a year of treatment, Mm. Um, I was just, I thought, I've got to have something to hang on to that isn't going to change, because so much has changed, Marie's gone, I'm, I'm wounded, I'm, so I just kept very focused on, I'm going to go back, and, you know, the army, the army shrink, they sent to look at me, and check me out, mm. like and an he said MOT. you were mad before. Yeah, he said, he said, you're probably mad anyway, you know. <laughs> 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 he said, and he said, with the army, he said, we send them out mad and bad, and they come back mad and bad. Yeah. So he said, you know, you seem quite mad enough to yeah. carry on. And so. yeah. One of the things, I mean, th this was most true of, m of me in the, in the early 90s when I was doing Bosnia the whole time. One of the things I came to dislike in myself, actually, was that I was so obsessed by that war, so committed to it, that when I got home, I couldn't wait to get back. And I sort of despised everything else. Nothing else seemed to matter. Mm. I couldn't understand why people cared about the value of the pound. The pound, I mean, I was in Sarajevo on Black Wednesday when uh, the pound lost 17% of its value in, in, in a day and Norman Lamont's reputation was destroyed forever. And I thought, why does anybody care about that? Why does anybody care about house prices, yeah. inflation? Because you're, you're, you're immersed in an existential fight Absolutely. and nothing else seems to matter. And I don't think that's very healthy. No, no, you come back, I always find it, when people say it must be really hard when you go out there, I find it going out there quite easy because yeah. you hit the ground, you sit, meet a few mates, yeah. you're doing the job again. Yeah. It's the coming back bit. Yeah. That you know, I remember coming back from Kosovo. I'd been about five months out there, and I had a mate come round, and it was all, you know, 
hugs and loves and that. And then she started going, she oh, got me phone bill in today, it was 230 quid. And I'm like, I just couldn't, I was like, well, so what? You know, I mean, I was that disengaged from, and I just found being there, it was almost, you know, I got back and it was lovely to see everyone, but you know, it wasn't long before the cog started to yeah. and saying, you know, how can yeah. I get back out there yeah. and, and carry on? Because you're so immersed in it. And yeah. it was, There's a wonderful passage in a, a book by Dexter Filkins, the brilliant American journalist, where he says, he, he, went, he did 10 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then he went to do a master's at, at Harvard, and he would go running around Cambridge at night and uh, just to be alone because, and he, he, he describes a conversation he had with uh, his, uh, another friend in, on the phone who'd done the same thing and he said, um, you know, people would ask you what the war was like, was it as bad as uh, people said? And you'd say, oh yeah, it's worse. And you'd start to answer and after 10 seconds or so you'd see people's eyes yeah, glaze yeah, over. Yeah. And so you found yourself seeking out the company of other journalists who'd been there, of soldiers who'd been there, of NGO workers who'd been there. And he said to his friend George, you know, I can't have a conversation about Iraq with anybody who hasn't been there. And his friend George said, I can't have a conversation with anybody who hasn't been to Iraq about anything mm -hmm. at all. And so it is, the more you do it, you do become isolated yeah. from normal, yeah. healthy society. From the normal side of yeah. life. You're, descri you're, you're describing the classic symptoms of early onset PTSD. Am I? I think you are. And this is the, the army have identified this. As, and this is why when troops come back from uh, deployment in Afghanistan, they're not allowed to go back to their families for 10 days. They're put into Cyprus. Yeah. And they're made to wear their uniforms uh, and sit on the beach and talk about what they've done before they go back yeah. to give them a sort of a valve before they... And it's probably the same for journalists. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this question is for Mr. Ferguson. Could you talk to me more why... Is it that um, Somalia became one of the most dangerous places on earth? Why did it? Yeah. Um, or how did this come did about? It? Uh, well, it's sometimes called the world's most failed state. I mean, it had a civil war in um, uh, uh, 1991. There's been no government, no central government since 1991. So uh, it's a society which is completely uh, atomized. There is no society in, in, in Somalia, no government for, for over a generation. Uh, it's combined with this kind of um, something about Somalia, uh, the kind of the, the clan makeup of the place lends itself to extreme violence. And it's always been there in Somali society because it's great competition for grazing rights, in fact, is what it goes back to. Um, but in the olden days, they would, um, they would settle their differences with spears and arrows, and then they got armed over the 20th century. Uh, it was a Cold War. Um, uh, hotbed, both, both, um, if that's possible, both sides, Russians. Cold War hotbed. Cold War hotbed. Um, both sides armed it because th they changed sides in the middle of it, so it got it got double armed uh, back in the 19, sort of 1980s, uh, and there was an invasion of Ethiopia and so on. So it's highly militarized. Then the government collapsed, wasn't replaced for 20 years, and there's a kind of clan, um, clan civil war which went on for 20 years. And it was abandoned by the West as well. I and mean, America tried to sort it out in the early 90s. Um, disastrously. Got, disastrously. Um, and <coughs> withdrew. So we're not doing that again. And you remember Black Hawk Down. So the place was left to its own devices for another 20 years. And then Al-Qaeda turned up. Um, so it's had everything. Absolutely everything has kind of happened to Somalia. That was when um, the, um, the Americans landed in the dead of night in great secrecy, only to find <laughs> CNN on the beach waiting for them. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of surreal moment. Um, the most fully filmed, you know, beach landing ever. Yeah. Very yeah. bizarre. Very bizarre. Um, yes. This isn't a facetious comment, but I guess none of you went to the school careers advice and said, find me a place to go to that's absolutely desperate and uh, I'll stay there forever. So my serious question is, how did you get into it, all of you? Why did you get into it? Paul. Um, I was, I was in the military for six years, and I came out, um, I went to Liverpool, I, I did some sound engineering, I was in a band in the army, so I'd learned how to do a bit of sound engineering, did that for a while, and it was just involved sitting in rooms at night with kind of drunk musicians, which was fun. Um, but then I had some mates who had gone down to the Balkans, delivered an aid, and I, I'd always shot stills and, and films, so they said, you know, do you want to come down the Balkans? So I, I just said, absolutely. Yeah. Got in, but it was great because it was like, it was made up of the most bizarre bunch of people that were like, there were some anarchist road protesters 
a bunch of Sikhs, some um, kind of ex Greenham Common type. So it was just this incredible mix of people. And they had to do everything democratically. So halfway through Europe, they stood there and they're having a vote which way to go and all that. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is fantastic. And, the, and then there's a couple of guys standing there and I said, why aren't you voting? He goes, Paul, I'm an anarchist. <laughs> 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 so, so we we got we got down the boat and was like we're, we're trying to find someone to give this aid to. So we eventually we stopped in a village and they thought I'll just give it out, you know. But honestly, God, it was like all these guys are walking around in like Nike tracksuits and all of this, you know. Mm. And they're giving them out clothes and it looked like the village when you put them. It looked like a Bay City Rollers convention, <laughs> <laughs> like horrible jumpers with three stars and flares and that. And they were just throwing it back. They go, we don't want that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just stayed, you know, they said, look, it's time to go. And I, and I, I stayed on and I, and I stayed about four months, I think, four or five months and, and shot a film and kind of made it. And uh, Channel 4 saw it and they sent me off on another job and it, it just spiralled, really. I slipped into it by accident, but, yeah, that's the way. I was never like, I'm going to do this. It was just, I've got to get out of this studio and see, see some fresh air again. I met a cr crowd like that in Bosnia right at the beginning. I was trying to get into, Sar into Sarajevo for the first time right at the start of the war. And um, we were coming down through central Bosnia and I saw this London bus <laughs> oh, yeah, on the road. Yeah, Do you yeah, remember that? Yeah, it was yeah. a London bus full of hippies. <laughs> Try they didn't have much aid, but they, they wanted to go anywhere. And, they were trying and I thought, well, maybe I can go with them. Maybe I can if they get into Sarajevo, I'll just get on the bus and kind of hide. <laughs> and there was a guy from Glasgow there doing a, an impression of a Glasgow clippy. And he was, he was saying, Come on, get off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we didn't get very far. The hippies didn't make it. So, uh, um, but everybody gets into it by accident. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. some strange, some some strange turn of events takes you there. I mean, I, you know, I started in much more for actually doing war much more formally. I got sent to, I, I was about tw in my late 20s when the first Gulf War, and I was terrified that I'd be left out. And the, the foreign editor said, called me in and said, I want you to go to Baghdad. And I was A, terrified, and B, thrilled. Absolutely. But not terrified in the way that you expect to be terrified. I was terrified in case I wasn't up to it, you know, in case I wasn't good enough. And um, I mean, I think all good reporters carry that, this idea that this time they're going to be found out. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, <laughs> you'll be no. revealed as a complete fraud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and everything has just been yeah. a big accident. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> James. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I. You know, I was more surprised than anybody to find myself doing what I do, really. I mean, I, I, I didn't go into journalism to write about fluff, uh, mm. I don't think. But it is fun. I mean, that's the point. I mean, you get the, you never feel more alive than when someone's pointing a gun at you. There's this sort of funny paradox yeah. about, about, about it. And, I mean, obviously you don't want to push it too far. But, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the part of it, actually, also, I, I, I don't consider myself to be a sort of war... You know, exclusive war correspondent, and I'd be happy to write about other things. I have written about other things. I've written about 1950s um, food science and stuff. I mean, I, but somehow it doesn't really pay. Um, people don't really want to read about that mm. so much. And it's and I do have an editor and an agent who say yeah, they're not pushing me to go to another war zone, but it's quite clear that that's what you know there's a market for it. And I've found myself as a sort of exponent of it, I suppose. Mm. But it is very interesting trying to explain these completely failed places that yeah. have. Baffled uh, everybody. I, really I was given them um, when when uh, I got back to London and Marie's um, Marie's friends were going through a, a house, <laughs> a horrible job of mm. moving someone's life. On. Um, Richard, their, their boyfriend, came up and he said, "I found this." And they had an envelope and he gave it to me. He said, "I think it's it was Marie's lighter," and on it was it was from um, Vietnam in in the sixties and inscribed on it, it was like you've never really lived until you've nearly died. Yeah. And he said, I think this is quite appropriate for you. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. but that was, you know, she had that on her desk and that was when she'd be bashing away in, in London. Yeah. Then. The other thing is a very bonding experience. I mean the quite every now and again a small group of people who did Bosnia get together and it's kinda like family. It, you mm. you mm. It, it lasted four years and yeah. and you never really leave it behind, especially if you do it when you're young. And uh, there's a joke that, that uh, a South African correspondent that I got to know who didn't do Bosnia used to tell. He would roll his eyes and say, 
How many Bosnia correspondents does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. How could you know? You weren't there. <laughs> quite pointed, quite pointed. Bosnia was particularly, particularly like that, wasn't it? It had a very strange effect on the, on the, yeah. on the call there. Yeah, it did. I might... yeah, it did. Uh, let's, um, yeah, there's a question here at the front, just here in the second row, and then one at the back there too. <clears throat> Gentlemen, uh, what is the most beautiful words you know in any language? Atina <laughs> Sipsi. In Arabic, or Libyan Arabic, that's have you got a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a prepared answer for that. I, gosh, good question. I'll think about it and let you know afterwards. I can say, have you got a cigarette in Bosnian? <laughs> <laughs> and me, me and Miles, the guy I went in with at one point, we also learned, can I breastfeed in here just to mess with people's minds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to finish with one. I, I'm sorry I haven't got a good answer yet. It's a brilliant it's a question. question. It's a lovely question. And I wish I'd, I, I'll think about it and get, and get back to you in the course of the day. Uh, I want to finish with one story. There's a story that um, Oberon War used to tell about being invited to give a, a, a speech, after dinner speech, in, in West Africa, in Senegal. Uh, and it was a very bad phone line he was taking, taking, taking the invite, and they asked him to speak about breastfeeding. <laughs> so he did some work and he pre pre prepared, and it was to the, it was the Senegalese um, uh, Foreign Correspondents Association or something, the local Senegalese journalists anyway asking. So he got there. And he gave his after dinner speech on breastfeeding. He thought there was an interest in breastfeeding in Africa because of clean water and so on, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said they were completely mystifying because they thought they'd invited, to, invited him to speak about press freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that happy note, I'm going to say thank you all very much indeed. I've got to finish now. Um, I'm being told from the back to wind up. So, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Paul and James.